All right, I'm going to ask for you to open up your Bibles this morning. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll pass one out to you, either in English or in Spanish. But we're going to be in Romans, the book of Romans, and we're going to be in chapter 12. And I'm going to take the time to read it first, and then we're going to jump right into it, okay? So Romans chapter 12. If you're looking for Romans, it's in the New Testament. It's right after the Gospels and the book of Acts, and then comes the book of Romans. It's Paul's letter, and here he talks specifically about worship. It's a rather long passage, and so I'm going to read it to you. And it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, okay, brothers and sisters, he includes both there, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper what? Your true and proper what? Worship. Type that down in the chat. This is your worship, he says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Because God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen. That's what Paul says. That's where it came from. He started it. He said God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by his grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment. It's interesting how people, when they come to communion, they sometimes feel like they don't deserve it. The truth is, we don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. That's why Paul says, don't think of yourself higher than you ought to. Realize you are broken, a sinner, and that's why we come. Because we need his grace. We need to be forgiven. And he continues on and says... With sober judgment in accordance with faith, God is distributed to each of you. For just as each of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. Now he's talking about the church. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. This is why it's important to be in church on Sunday morning. Because it's not just what you need, but maybe somebody else needs your gifting, your love, your prayers, your encouragement. Maybe God wants to use you in a mighty way. And this is why he says it's important that all we're many to come together as one. That's something you can't do online. I love you online community, but you need to be in the house of God. Because you need to be amongst the fellowship of believers to use your gifts And he continues on and says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And then he continues on here and pivots a little bit and said love must be sincere hate what is evil cling to what is good be devoted to one another honor one another above yourselves never lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the lord be joyful in hope patient in affliction faithful in prayer share with the lord's people who are in need practice hospitality Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That seems impossible. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome 
by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this morning, I want to talk to you very specifically on how to worship. How do you worship? We've talked about what is worship. The first week, Pastor Eric talked all about worship, and it's what we ascribe worth to. We talked about who are you worshiping. If you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping something. It's whatever's most valuable to you. That's what you're worshiping. Last week, we actually took the time to talk about pain and what does it mean to worship through pain and suffering. If you missed any of these weeks, you can always go back and listen to it. But today I want to talk to you about how do you worship? Is there a specific way to worship? Is there certain songs that we have to worship? Is it a style of worship? Do I have to raise my hands when I worship? Do I have to get on my knees when I worship? Is there a certain posture when I worship? We've been talking about and practicing these different things going into every single week. Last week we had a moment of silence just a moment of reflection when I'm quiet and I stand before God, like he says to wait on him, is that worship? We talked about scripture when I read scripture and I'm I'm sitting here reflecting and meditating on God's word, is is that worship? When I'm praying or reading the psalm, is that worship? How do you worship? Well, Paul gives us the answer this morning as he talks about how we are to actually worship. How do you specifically worship? And what he tells us is that worship is a response to God's grace. Worship is a response to God's grace. How do you respond to God's grace that he has given to you? How do you respond to God's grace to you? That's what Paul is saying. Notice the words that that Paul actually starts out with in Romans 12. He says, therefore. That's the first word here, therefore. And so something came before it. Something happened before therefore. And what Paul is talking about is how God has created the heavens on the earth and how we abandon God and how we are sinful but Jesus Christ came to die for our sins and it is a gift and it is grace and how God has overcome sin with Jesus's death and resurrection and so that's why we did communion this morning communion when I take communion is that a form of worship absolutely but we could just go through the motions a lot of times you just Some of us have come out of Orthodox or even Catholic backgrounds, right? And we just take communion. We don't even know what it means. We just do it. It's a practice that we did. And Paul is saying, that's not worship. When you're just going through the motions, he says it has to be a response to God's grace. Therefore, he tells us that God acted first and we are to respond. That God initiated and we are to respond to that initiation. Just look at John 3, 16. Many of, many of us know that verse, right? We have it memorized. It's one of the first ones we learned a lot of times in Sunday school. If you don't, memorize it now. For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave. gave. Type gave in the chat. God gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God Gay first, we respond. God initiates, we respond. Worship is our response to God. So how do you respond to God's grace? See, I want to talk to you about this topic because so many of us claim Jesus. So many people in the world claim Jesus, but I would argue that they're not worshiping. Jesus. So many of us claim Jesus with our mouth, but are we responding to God's grace? Well, Pastor Chris, I come to church. Well, Pastor Chris, I I try to read the Bible. Well, Pastor Chris, I'll say a five-minute prayer right before I eat or right before I go to bed or when I get up in the morning. That's, I'm, I'm doing something. 
but are you really worshiping? That's what Paul is talking about. How do you worship? And he describes it here for us. In fact, he says, number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you pull out the Source Church app, you can put it right there. It's a fill in the blank, okay? It's a total commitment. That's what he says. You, you have to be all the way in. It's a, it's a total commitment. Look at what the words he actually uses here in verse number one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. See, God initiated. God's mercy, he initiated his mercy. Jesus died for us. Paul is explaining that, that God was merciful. We deserved hell. We deserved death. We deserve punishment, but the punishment went to the cross. The punishment was on Jesus instead of us. So how do you respond to that? That's what he's asking. And he says, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The reason he says bodies is because it's a total commitment, It's all the way in. You have to give everything you have. You have to give your full self, your body, to everything. That's how Paul explains it. You can't have one foot in and one foot out. You can't be playing on the fringes anymore. He says if you really, really want to truly worship God, if you really want to make a commitment to God, you have to make a total commitment. You can't say, you know what, God, I'm going to come and do this thing on Sunday morning, but I'm going to live for myself Monday through Saturday. I'm going to come and and raise my hands and praise you and say, Jesus, name, and and pray that all my prayers get answered. But I'm going to go clubbing on Thursday night with my friends. I'm going to do this on Friday. I'm going to spend time doing this on Saturday. I'm going to live for me. I'm going to chase after money. No, he says, no, it's everything you have, all of yourself, your full body, your family, everything. He says that you need to put it in. It's a total commitment. In fact, when Paul uses this term body, he's implying it's the whole person. It's how a soldier would actually give up his sword in a battle, and he would raise his hands in surrender. When we give our bodies, he's saying that we give ourselves. We come in and say, Jesus, you can have all of me. You can have my thoughts. You can have my actions. You can have my deeds. I'm not going to say one thing and do another. No, I'm going to live for you. You get all of it. You get my mind and you get my heart, which leads to my action, a total commitment. In the New Covenant... We don't bring an animal sacrifice anymore. He says that we are living sacrifices. We, our bodies, are living sacrifices. Instead, we bring ourselves. We no longer bring an animal sacrifice. Instead, we bring all of us. And we sacrifice ourselves on the altar because of what Jesus has done. That we say, Jesus, you can have all of me. In the new covenant, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the living sacrifices because of the sacrifice that Jesus has already made. I mean, it kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but he he continues on because he says living sacrifices, living that you're living, but you're sacrificed. When you give everything else up, you're saying it's no longer my will. It's no longer what I want to do. It's no longer what I crave and I desire. You're sacrificing all of that in order to follow him. It's a complete living sacrifice. That's why he says you're living, because you can't sacrifice something that's dead. You you can't take something dead and kill it again. He says, no, you're living. You see, dead fish float downstream. They don't swim upstream. And what he says is, because you're living, because you're alive, because Jesus Christ made you alive, you are not to conform to the patterns of this world. You are to be different. J.B. Phillips says it like this. Don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. 
Don't let the world or culture squeeze you into the mold that they want to shape for you. Someone is after your worship. It's either God or culture. And we at the Source Church hold this value. It's one of our values that you'll see on the sign is we identify with Christ, not culture. We're going to be put in his mold, not culture's mold. We're going to transform and conform to him, to Jesus, not to culture and the rest of the world. But so many people are telling you how to live. The news is telling you how to live. Government officials are telling you how to live. And we find all these people are coming after our time and our worship, and yet it only belongs to God. The word tells us how to live. And Paul says that we are to identify with Christ and not culture, that he wants all of us. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount the same thing. He said, don't be like them talking about the rest of the world. Don't be like them, be like me. Follow me. I'm leading you. I'm guiding you. When the disciples followed Jesus, they were all in. It was a total commitment. They followed after him. When he slept, they slept. When he ate, they ate. When he drank, they drank. When they, he rested and sat down, they rested and sat down. They followed him exactly the way that he did. They became like him. It's a total commitment. See, the primary goal of worship is to become like God, the one who we follow. We're transformed like Jesus. That's why it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you conform to the patterns of this world, if you follow after the patterns of the world, you're not going to follow after God. He wants you to follow after him. He wants you to mimic him. He wants you to become more like his son, Jesus. That's his desire, is for us to be totally in our response to his mercy and to his grace is we respond by giving everything we have in a total commitment to follow after him. That should be our response, Paul says. Where the rest of the world is going to tell you that it's all about you. The rest of the world is going to tell you you got to get what you can receive. You got, it's more about what you have. It's more about what you can take. You're not going to go on Instagram and start flipping through social media and see, oh, yes, this person's giving this away. This person's doing this. No, it's all about you, your vacations, you, your family, you, what you can obtain, what you can get. But Paul says worship is completely different. Worship is an emptying of yourself for you to become on the altar as a living sacrifice. There's only two sacrifices that were living that was really mentioned in the Bible, and that was first Isaac when, in the Old Testament when Abraham took Isaac and he put him on the altar, and he was about to kill him. He was about to slay his own son. And as the knife was about to come down, the angel of the Lord said, Stop. You see, God had commanded Abraham to take his son up a mountain and sacrifice him. He wanted to see if Abraham would give his most precious possession, which is his own child. I can't imagine being in Abraham's shoes. I don't know what I would do if God says, hey, give me your kids. I'd be like, no, they're mine. God says, no, they're a gift that I've given you. You're to manage your kids. You are to raise your kids. You are to disciple your kids, but those kids are mine. He wanted to see if Abraham would give up his most prized possession. What's your most prized possession? that you hold on to, that you value the most. And he says, Abraham, stop, when Abraham was about to kill him, and then he gives him a ram off in the thicket, and he kills it. The second living sacrifice was Jesus. Jesus went to the cross alive and died as a living sacrifice on the altar, which was the cross, in order for you and I to be forgiven. He was a living sacrifice, willing to give it all. And the question is, are you willing to respond to God's mercy and love and grace by giving everything to it? Are you willing to commit your relationship and say, you know what, I've been praying for that boyfriend or the girlfriend and I'm just gonna seek after them and pursue them and God says, are you, is that your idol? 
Because if you put me first, I can give you the boyfriend or the girlfriend, but you need to put me first and you need to put that on the, the altar. Or is it your job? Pastor Chris, I'll show up to church, you know, and I'll fill up on live stream and stuff during the week, but you know, my job, that, that comes first. What's, maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your kids. What is it that's most valuable to you? And he's saying, what do you need to put on the altar? Because he's asking for a total commitment. He says, don't be playing the field here. Don't be involved with one foot in, one foot out. Don't be involved in multiple relationships with God and everything else. No, quit playing the field. Jesus wants your total commitment. He wants your total commitment because he is completely and totally committed to you. He gave everything for you. He died for you in order for you to have life. He gave it all for you. He was totally committed to you, and he still is. He's still committed to you. He's still present. Now he gives you his Holy Spirit, and he says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if he's totally committed to us, how many of us are running around and cheating on him? How many of us have one foot in and one foot out, and we're trying to see about this God thing, and He's like, if you really want to respond to me, you're going to be all the way in, totally committed. You see, worship is not just part of your life. Worship becomes your life. That's why we named this series 24-7. Because it's not something you can just do for one hour on Sunday morning. Worship is not just an action. It's a complete lifestyle. It's everything it becomes who you are. It's your lifestyle. You embrace worship because it becomes your actions. It's what you do. It's what you believe. It's how you think. This is why he says, don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be by transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. The renewing of your mind to be constantly filled up on how God wants me to live so I can live it out. I'm going to renew my mind with what God wants. It's not just an hour on Sunday morning. No. It's 24-7. Worship is not just one hour a week. It's all the time. It's what you do at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's what you do at 9.30. It's what you do at your office. It's how you treat people. It's what you do when you treat your spouse. It's how you treat your kids. It's how you run your business. Do you cheat people to get ahead and get more profit? Or are you generous and giving? You see, worship is not just of lift my hands and sing a song. Worship is not just about music. Worship is a lifestyle. It's how you think which then controls how you act. It's how you believe in your value system and how it comes out of your pores. Worship is a response to God's grace. And so the first thing is it's a total commitment. The second thing is it's a logical response, he says. It's completely logical. Because if he gives us grace, how do we respond to that grace? Think of it this way. What can your kids honestly offer you? What can your kids offer you? Or as a child, what could you offer your parents? I mean, you can't give them financial security. You can't give them, you know, money. I mean, a lot of times... You know, they scarcely give you love. If you're lucky, they give you some love back. But as a parent, you're constantly sacrificing for your kids. As a parent, or a good parent, I should say, you're constantly sacrificing for your kids. You're laying your life down for your kids. And what do your kids give you in return? It's, it's the same thing with God. Is The best thing for a parent is if their child can recognize and be thankful for what they have. I give a roof over your head. I give a bed for you to sleep in. I give a house for you. I drive you around to activities, to sporting events. I help your education. I study with you. And a kid can't repay any of that, can they? 
They don't have the means to repay any of that. But the best thing for a parent is to sit there and just admire their kids and say, they appreciate what I do. It's the same thing with God. God gives us everything. We can't give him anything back. But the greatest reward for God is when we worship him because he admires and we show gratitude. And how do we show gratitude? By giving everything to him. It's a logical response. Christian living grows out of something. It's a response for gratitude. I I love the way that, that this is expressed as a response. Express, worship is love expressed is another way to say it. Express means to convert a thought or feeling in word and by gestures and what? Conduct. By gestures and conduct. Look at what it says in Romans 12, three through eight. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't walk around conceited. Don't walk around proud. Don't walk around thinking everybody is below you and treating people that way. No, Paul says be humble. Think of other people as equals. Realize that if someone doesn't treat you the way that you should be treated, maybe it's because they don't have what you have. Maybe they don't have Jesus in their life. Maybe you have a gift that God has given you, but you don't hold that against them. You don't walk around No, you love them. You pray for them. He says, don't be proud or conceited or prideful, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, realizing that you don't deserve it either. Realizing before you judge them for their sins that you're a sinner too. Realizing before you condemn them for their actions, realize you make mistakes also. And when we think about that with sober judgment... He says, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so we in Christ, though many, form one body, and each member belong to the others. We have different gifts. Now, if you remember to the church in Corinth, they were arguing about the gifts. One person was saying, well, I got the gift of prophecy, ha, ha, ha. Well, I got the gift of teaching, ha, ha, ha. Well, everybody wants to be on stage. Everyone wants to be the pastor. You know what? I'll give you the mic. I'll step off and you can step on. But the truth of the matter is, we sometimes look at somebody and say, I want to be like that. I want to do what they do. And we don't appreciate the gifts that God has given to us. We don't appreciate the role or the function that God has given to us. In the church, we could not function without everybody. I can't be in here praying and out there greeting at the same time. I can't be at the front um, tent greeting people as they come here and also be in the sanctuary greeting at the same time. I can't do it all. I can't be here teaching you and be in Power Kids teaching the children. It's impossible. We need different people who have different functions, who have different gifts, and nobody is better than the other. We need people who are willing to clean up after church. And guess what? The pastor isn't better than anybody else. The toilet gets clogged. You'll see me go in there with the plunger. Because sometimes you need to serve. And that's what he's saying is that all of us have different gifts. And so expression, it happens through feeling of word and also conduct. If our worship is supposed to be a response to God, here's my question for you. Then how many people are actually seeing the blessings of God? If your conduct and your actions are supposed to be a response to God's grace, are you seeing the actual grace show up in your everyday life? Are are you seeing God that he is good, that he deserves our worship? Because God is good, Paul says. But are you using your eyes to constantly see more of his glory and stand more in his awe? Are you using your ears to be tuned in to the voice 
of the Holy Spirit? Are you using your mind to comprehend the mysteries of God through the Bible? When you actually read a passage, how does this apply to my daily life? What is the mystery behind here? Are you feeling strong affections for Christ deep in your bones that when you come in here, you can't help but raise up your hands in worship. And the people who seem like a fanatic at worship, maybe it's because they see the grace of God in their lives more than anybody else. Maybe they realize that they were slaves at one time, a prisoner to sin, but now Jesus has set them free. You see, so many times we want to be reserved and we're scared of what the person next to us is thinking. Well, I can't worship because of how they're going to think. Well, I'm just going to stand here and I'm just going to have my hands in my pocket pocket and I'm just going to pretend I'm going to sing a little bit but you know I'm feeling the music it's all about me but I'm telling you when you've been stuck in an addiction when you've been stuck as a prisoner to something and you know that Jesus has set you free when you've experienced any time of imprisonment in your life and you now have freedom you can't wait but to run outside you can't wait but to lift up your hands you can't wait but to get joyful as a response for what he has done. Some of you get a lot more excited than others. And you're expressing your worship. You're responding to what God has done. And I'm just wondering, how many of us aren't responding because we're not seeing God in our life? We're not seeing God show up. We're wondering if he's good. We're starting to doubt his goodness because our minds are stuck in culture and the world and it's not being transformed the way that Paul describes that we should be transformed. See, some of us have this idea that we don't want to. If either worship God with our lips or do we worship God with our life? Do we worship God with just our lips? Or do we worship God with all of ourselves, all of our action, and all of our life? Look at what Isaiah 29, 13 says. These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. He says they honor me with their lips but they don't honor me with their actions. They don't honor me with their life. They're not living for me. Martin Luther said it like this. When we worship God, a dairy maid can milk cows to the glory of God. When we worship God, we can do it through every single action that we have. It doesn't matter whether I'm plunging the toilet. It doesn't matter whether I'm cleaning the bathroom. It doesn't matter what I'm greeting outside. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. When I do it for the glory of God, when I do it as a lifestyle, when I'm cleaning up vomit after my kid because I'm taking care of them when they're sick, I'm worshiping God. When I'm taking care of my spouse and I really don't want to because I'm in a bad mood. When I come home from work and I'm upset and I'm anxious, but my kid says, hey, can you play with me? Everything we do is a worship to God. It's a lifestyle. It's an action. And what Paul is saying is, are you really worshiping God? So how do I worship? Well, I got some things for you. As he goes into this last part, I'm going to rush through these really quick. And he says, how do we worship? Look at what it says in this last section of verses 14 through 21. The first one is, be kind. Be kind. Determined to bring your enemy good, not harm. Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Be kind to one another. Bless those who curse you. It's so easy to curse somebody who curses you. It's so easy to curse somebody who's nasty to you. Somebody gives you the finger on the highway, what do you want to do? You want to cut them off. Or you give them the finger right back, right? The South Florida hello. The hand gesture, I see you, buddy. But no, what does he say? Bless those who curse you. Be kind. Someone gives you the finger, just wave. I mean, if you blow them a kiss... They might think that you're being sarcastic and cut you off and be even mean. But just wave. 
Say, I'm sorry. Thank them. Be kind when people are mean to you, when they curse you, when they ridicule you, when they talk behind your back. Still be kind to them. It's hard to do. The second thing he says is be present. Show love and concern for people. Look at what he says in verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Rejoice and with those who rejoice. Be present with them. Notice when someone is rejoicing over something, but often when somebody else is having a great day, they were just blessed with a vacation package. They saved and someone gave them something or they went away. It's like, I want to do that. I'm so jealous of that. We get angry when people are actually um, blessed with something instead of rejoicing with them. You want to realize that you can be grateful for somebody, then actually be grateful for them. You want to worship, then you be grateful when somebody else is blessed. Give gratitude to God. Thank God for it. But often we're miserable when someone's blessed. And sometimes we're a little bit happy when people mourn, especially if we don't like them. But he says it should be the opposite. We should rejoice when people rejoice and we should mourn when people mourn. We should be present with them in their suffering and we should be present with them when they're happy. Be humble. Do not allow yourself to think you are better. Be humble. Look at what he says in verse 16. He continues to go down. These are all action verbs. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Be humble. These are all actions he's telling us to take. This is how we are to worship, to be kind, to be present, to be humble, to be wise. Do not allow another evil to determine your response. If someone shows evil to me, I react. He says, don't react. Respond. Well, how should I respond, Pastor Chris, by being wise? Go to the book of Proverbs. It's all about wisdom. How do I respond when someone's cruel to me? How do I respond when someone's meat to thee? Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Be wise be righteous do what is right even when someone else does what is wrong when someone hurts you you don't hurt them back be wise be wise in every situation be peaceful always try to maintain an atmosphere of peace if it is possible as for it depends on you live at peace with everyone romans 12 18 says if it is possible live at peace with everyone, your actions should be peaceful. Or 19, do not take refuge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. What does that mean? When somebody hurts you, you don't hurt them back, you forgive them. Be forgiving. Be forgiving. Let God worry about repaying evil. Be forgiving. And the last one is be loving. Be loving. Look at what it says. Give your enemy what he needs, not what he deserves. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. This reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 25. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, he told his disciples, he says, listen, the king is going to come back and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And his disciples were like, well, how do I become a sheep? And what is a goat? He said, the sheep are coming with me to heaven. The goats, we're separating them out. They're not with us. They're not part of our group. Well, how do I become a sheep, Jesus? They said, you want to know how to become a sheep? He said, this is, this is how. He said, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Jesus says, what you give to the least of these, you do for me. He says, when you see somebody hungry, give them something to eat. When you see them thirsty, give them something to drink. Give them, when someone needs and they're in prison, go and visit them. Be present with them. Be with them. Well, what if I don't like them, Jesus? The least that you do for them, you do for me. What if I don't get along with them, Jesus? The least you do for them, you do for me. See, this is why it's possible to love even our enemies. This is how it's possible in order to love 
those we don't like and those we don't get along with. Because you're not doing it for them. You need to understand this when it comes to worship. You're not doing that for them. I don't want to go plunge the bathroom. I don't want to clean. I don't want to go to church today. You're not doing it for anybody else. You're not even doing it for you. You know who you're doing it for? You're doing it for God. You're doing it because of what he's done for you. You're doing it out of honor as a response to what he's already given you. So you're not doing it for them. I don't want to bless them. I don't even like them. He says, it doesn't matter. You're doing it for God. What you do for the least of them, you also do for me. When did we see you sick or in prison or go and visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Paul was writing to the Roman church where persecution was happening, where Christians were being killed for their faith, where brothers and sisters were being thrown in prison and things were starting to get heated up culture was starting to invade the church culture was starting to attack the church the people had to decide are we in or are we out are we going to listen to culture and the government are we going to listen to jesus and the church and they had to make these decisions and paul says how you treat that roman soldier who said something about you how you treat that person who was against you, how you treat that other individual who tried to hurt you, he said, you did for me. Do not repay evil for evil. Do not get vengeance when you can. You give forgiveness. Do not, and he gives all of these do nots over and over again in this passage. Look, it's all about actions. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. Over and over he says, says, this is how you are to love. Your action, your response, your love for the world is your worship. Are you worshiping God through your life? Are you worshiping God through your actions? It is not something we can do by ourselves. In fact, it reminds me of what Jesus says in Matthew 22. And I'll leave you with this, where he says, all of the commands, I summarize in just two of them. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That should be your first response because of what Jesus did for you. You should respond out of love and reverence to him. But number two is love your neighbor as yourself. That doesn't mean your friend. That doesn't mean just your family member. That means your neighbor. You might not get along with your neighbor. It means your coworker. You might not get along with your coworker. But the way that you treat them and the way that you honor them and the way that you love them honors God. It's worship to God. This is how we're going to transform the world is by your worship to God. Are you willing to respond to God to love other people even when you don't want to because God loved you first? It is not something you can do by yourself. It's something that only comes from the fruit of the Spirit. You say, Pastor Chris, I can't love like that. You're right. You can't. In your human nature, you don't even want to. But I'm here to tell you, when you receive Jesus and the love that he has for you, the Holy Spirit comes into you, and it gives you the ability to be able to love like that. It gives you the ability to be able to worship like that because of his grace that he has for you. Look at what it says in Galatians 5, 22 through 25. 
but the fruit of the spirit. See, some of you don't have the spirit because you're not experiencing the fruits. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Some of you need the Holy Spirit because you're in a tough situation. Some of you are in tough relationships. You're at each other's throats in your marriage and you need the Holy Spirit to step in and intervene because you're not showing very much love right now. And I'm questioning whether you're really worshiping Jesus with your marriage, whether you're really worshiping Jesus in your family, whether you're really worshiping Jesus Monday through Saturday, or has it just become a checklist? I show up to church and I go about my way. But if you're going to live worshiping Jesus because he died for us on the cross, it's how you love one another. And if you're not experiencing that love right now, then you need to pray for the Holy Spirit to intervene and be in your life more than ever before. I'm gonna ask for you to bow your heads because some of you need that love right here, right now. It starts with an honest confession that we're gonna pray. Maybe you need to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe he's been your Lord or maybe he's been your savior for a long time, but you haven't made him your Lord where he's in control of all of your life. Maybe you haven't made a total commitment to jump both feet in. The thing about living sacrifices is they can often crawl off the altar and we crawl off all the time. And it's time this morning to put yourself back on the altar to say, Lord, you have all of me. Lord, you are my Lord, which means I will follow you. And I'm asking for your Holy Spirit to be inside of me to give me the love that I need right now. The thing that I cannot do by myself. If that's you right now, I just wanna pray for you. Repeat these words after me. Father, I come to you broken, empty. I'm emptying all of myself onto this altar. All of my desires, all of my will, I've stepped on this altar, Lord, and I've stepped right off and I've stepped on and I've stepped off, but this morning I'm stepping back on. I'm giving you everything. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I want you to help me follow you. Put love into my heart so I can love others the way you love me. In Jesus' name I pray. And God's people said, amen. Beautiful name it is you know. In the name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name